Good evening, everyone. I'm going to lean down because this is set for our speaker, and I don't want to change it. <laughs> um, I'm Arthur Zorn, and it's my pleasure to be here tonight. I thought I'd just give you a little background, very briefly, on what this is about and how this all became uh, an event. And how it came as this event is uh, Kathleen Keenan, and well, there she is, and uh, Danielle Wiskanski, uh, staff members, uh, important people here, uh, called me this spring. And we were talking about ways to augment the already, I don't think any of the work that Lost Nation Theater does needs augmentation, but well, hopefully tonight we'll augment the show cabaret in particular. Uh, we have a paint and sip event coming up that's been very successful the last few years. And uh, normally I've had some of my own art in the gallery and tonight the Vermont Holocaust Memorial, uh, important uh, writings there that you might uh, want to read the program is about an hour and 15 minutes long, no intermission, we're just going to go right ahead. And Danielle will zero you right in uh, about the specifics of tonight. I think you're going to be very, uh, become very knowledgeable on a certain aspect of, of that time that is resonating in our hearts and fears right now again, uh, unfortunately. The last thing I want to say is about the musical part of this. There are uh, readings, and then I'm going to play just four, I believe it is, every time Danielle sits down, that's my cue, brief, like one no, not longer than a minute, uh, a theme and variations on uh, Eastern European theme that's ex expanded. And then uh, three longer pieces. Uh, there's a, an intense part. There's some very humorous things, but there's some very intense things. And to give you time to, to um, absorb that between them, um, I'm going to play you know, a little bit longer uh, improvisations, and uh, we'll see how they go. And then uh, we'll all conclude and congratulate Danielle on her wonderful studies. Uh, we had no idea when I showed up that day that we had someone who uh, an intellectual scholar here who has done wonderful research on the subject you're going to hear about tonight. So Danielle is somewhere. And welcome, Danielle. Thank you. has always held a special fascination for people. It's a war that never ended, artistically speaking, that is. The Second World War may have ceased hostilities on, the, on September 2, 1945, but the world of film, literature, art, and theater have never stopped fighting. Nearly 70 years on, the demand for art based on the Second World War appears unstoppable, the supply inexhaustible. Even more than World War II, Audiences have always held a fascination with spies. Espionage is seen as dark, edgy, seedy, thrilling. And when it's a woman spy, we think violence, intrigue, and sex. Right? However, the true experience of spies, especially female spies during World War II, have largely remained unknown. Their exploits have gone unrecognized despite their dangerous and life-threatening work. The SOE, or Special Operations Executive, had a record 55 female agents, far surpassing the use of women in official active intelligence roles than at any other time in British history. Tonight, I'd like to share the stories of these female spies with you. I want to tell you their lives, how they ended up in the war, what they accomplished. But beyond that, I want you to understand their experience because only then can you acknowledge both their sacrifices and their achievements.
World War II had begun, the government understood that it would have to utilize women. And to some extent it did. Women were placed in menial positions that took little thought. However, slowly women began to be able to join the service. But their official roles were always to assist men, not to do very much work of their own. There was some progress towards integrated work, but the distinction between men and women was always upheld. For example, women in service could make all of the calculations and do any maneuver to move guns, but they weren't actually able to fire them. Or they could transport equipment, um, but they couldn't transport passengers. So who, women who found their way into the crossfire and held themselves in good stead were recognized, but they were given civilians honors, not military, because the British command didn't recognize women as being capable of performing in a military capacity. The SOE was officially formed in June of 1940 under the leadership of Hugh Dalton, and its role was to cultivate resistance for those living in occupied lands. Churchill ordered the SOE to set Europe ablaze, and the organization stopped at nothing, not even gender roles, to accomplish that mission. This was due partly to the new strategies that the British government felt could be utilized in World War II that hadn't been utilized in World War I, particularly that of guerrilla warfare. Sabotage was a key element, and that's what the SOE became solely responsible for. As a new organization, it was much easier for women to be utilized as there weren't any limitations already in place to be fought against as there would be in an existing organization. However, even with unofficial permission from Churchill and his cabinet to employ female spies, the SOE still faced many obstacles to retain them. Governmental lawyers and the highest Whitehall officials were opposed. Contemporary journalist Sarah Helm explained the dilemma in using women spies the most clearly. And she wrote, although the SOE already employed scores of women, mostly as typists, drivers, and clerks, women in the Army, Navy, and Royal Air Force were barred from armed combat. The statutes of the three services simply didn't envisage women bearing arms, and therefore there was no legal authority for service women to carry out any kind of guerrilla work that the SOE had in mind. Furthermore, Though all of the SOE's agents would be without uniforms and therefore liable to be shot as spies, women agents would have even less legal protection in the field than men. The 1929 Geneva Convention and the 1907 Hague Convention on Land Warfare, the main legal instruments offering protection to prisoners of war, made no provisions at all for protecting women, as women were not envisaged as combatants. These were serious concerns in which the organization had to sidestep both the law and military opposition. In the end, the SOE managed to avoid these issues by commissioning the SOE's women recruits through the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry, which as a, a civilian organization was not subjected to the same rules government entities were, and so they, avoid they avoided violating any laws or statutes. Yet because of societal restrictions, if the use of women as guerrilla fighters were to become public, the women would be disavowed, and the government would refuse to acknowledge or take responsibility for the women. Still, the SOE pushed forward, convinced that the job of courier would be best carried out by women. SOE began to recruit their female spies through talent spotting, which meant that people didn't apply but were funneled to them. 
Most had applied to work at other organizations like the Royal Air Force, but were then chosen for special employment. Most did not know why they had been chosen for secret work, though it usually had to do with their ability to speak French or if they had French lineage. The organization could seek out whoever had the talents and skills that they deemed necessary to become a spy, regardless of gender. It wasn't until April of 1942, though, that the SOE began to actually place women in the field. And even then, these women were initially only to be used as couriers in the field or as administrative staff in British headquarters. Yet women found their way into the field as the government faced bleaker and bleaker prospects in the war. They were forced to adapt to the wartime emergency and utilize everyone, even women, to turn the desperate tide of the war. The agency even had the power to sidestep the British national only law, um, which only allowed British citizens to serve as intelligence officers due to concerns about their loyalties. If their talent was enough, the organization would find a way to use them. So the SOE had active female field agents trained in weapons and unarmed combat, just as any male agent would be. Initially, they weren't supposed to have as active or dangerous roles as male spies. Part of the benefit of using female spies, Colonel Maurice Buckmaster said, was from the purely tactical point of view, women were able to move about without exciting so much suspicion as men and were therefore exceedingly useful to us as couriers. But by war's end, the missions they were assigned were no less dangerous than those of men. Spy Hannah Shenish courageously went forward alone with three male refugees she met along the way on her very first mission after her male counterparts refused to join, deeming it way too dangerous. And of the 55 female SOE agents, 13 were killed while out in the field, which amounts to nearly 25% of all of the female agents. The percentage of female SOE agents is tantamount with the number of all SOE spies killed in action in France. So the SOE's view and use of women was well in advance of the contemporary stance on using women in combat. However, this consideration only came about much later in the war, namely 1942, as I previously mentioned, and many of the standards that women were held to were much lower for men. SOE agent Sidney Hudson described himself I played golf and tennis in the summer with occasional interludes for mountain climbing. In the winter, I skied and played ice hockey. All of this obviously left me little time for any educational studies. His main qualifications for being a spy was being upper class, educated, athletic, and fluent in French. On the other hand, many of the women recruited to be spies were highly skilled in languages, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and more. Josephine Butler, who was a, church, a spy for Churchill's secret circle, was college educated, trained as a doctor, spoke multiple languages, was a judo champion, and had a photographic memory, while SOE agent Ma Mary Catherine Herbert spoke five languages. The first head of the SOE, Hugh Dalton, dictated that the kind of warfare that the SOE was going to practice 
was very, it was very specific. He believed that there were clear distinctions from war from without and war from within, and that sabotage was war from within, and that the latter was more likely to be better conducted by civilians than by soldiers. This allowed more women the chance to be recruited, even as women in service were not yet truly recognized as members of the military. If we go back to good old Agent Hudson, he could attest to the remarkable ability of women to blend in as civilians better than any male spy could, saying, I felt that a girl could pass unnoticed in the town or the countryside much more easily than could a man. He even made it one of his basic, basic principles of underground warfare, saying, Women may be better agents than men, and certainly less liable to arouse suspicion. A man together with a woman will also attract less notice than a man alone. Yet even then, there was a clear separation in the treatment of male and female spies. Though women were out in the field committing acts of subterfuge just as men were, their acts of subterfuge were less dangerous in nature. Men in civilian clothes would attack military convoys while women would carry clandestine messages. Though supposedly participating in equally important roles, men were given jobs that were more active, while women were supposed to stay back, doing tasks that put them less in the way of their comrades and out of harm's way. When France did fall, Britain was thrown into a state of emergency. The war was obviously not going as planned. So the government, from Churchill to his ministers to the newly appointed head of the SOE, Hugh Dalton, had to make use of their every asset to turn the tide against tyranny. And thus, women finally had the opportunity to be utilized to their full potential as they never had before, as spies. However, being allowed to enter the field did not mean that their path was clear of obstacles. Now that women could be spies, they had to tackle the new and unique challenges of being a woman out in the field. So the first question I'd like to pose to you is why did these women spy? SOE spy Sonia diartois Butt reportedly said, what little I was able to do was motivated by my love for France and because I could not imagine not doing my utmost when my country was at war. While fellow SOE spy Muriel Bick hid her past case of meningitis from the agency. So 
since the disease carried a small risk of recurring, it would have been against protocol to allow Vic to serve. But so great was her courage and her desire to see and serve her beloved country once again that she felt that the danger to her own life was a risk worth taking. This was particularly notable as Vic did end up passing away as a result of a resurgence of the disease while out in the field. Yvonne Cormu, who was another spy for the SOE, described why she went as such. The question of not going didn't arise. I was ready to go. I'd steeled myself. There was constant fear, but you had to learn to live with it. Beryl Escott, who's a contemporary squadron leader in the Royal Air Force, described the motivations of SOE intelligence officers succinctly, showing the depths of their patriotism when she said, SOE agents were not professional spies, just men and women volunteering to organize and supply resistance in an enemy-occupied country for the duration of the war. Their pay was absurdly low, and their abiding motive was to help in liberating the country that they loved. One of the biggest challenges that female spies faced was their treatment by men on all sides, their partners, their leaders, their contacts, and their enemies. While there was female solidarity in the field, every woman had a male partner or supervisor. And this female solidarity was formed in the training school before being sent out or in prison after they had already been captured. They were constantly underestimated and derided, hindered from doing their work by male contacts, staff, and spies. Often this wasn't intentional. The men were either trying to overcompensate for the female weaknesses that they expected, or they believed that women's strengths and successes were due to a more pronounced masculinity, or they were simply unable to look past a spy's gender. Spy trainers for the SOE said that they often had the female trainees parachute first in the practice jumps out of the planes at Tatton Park a training facility, because they believed that the men would do better and push themselves harder if women led the way. In the field, SOE spy Anne Marie Walters encountered difficulties completing her tasks because the men didn't want to work with her. She was tasked with helping to train the French McKee resistance fighters to use the new British and American arms, which they had never before encountered. However, the men didn't want to be instructed by a girl and they gave her a really hard time until they realized she was actually competent and could do her job. And Bunny Rye Mills, who was the Lysander pilot who shuttled SOE spy Cécile Mar Margot Lefort to France, was not very impressed by her French. To him, it didn't seem all that hot. He also thought privately that she looked rather like a vicar's wife. <laughs> Men's resistance to the use of women was an ongoing complication that the SOE didn't have a good way of handling. When women were first to be allowed into the field, many trainers objected. But as soon as they discovered that women could be just as skillful and brave as men, 
and this was soon proved in the field, where they also had to overcome the extra obstacle of the ingrained prejudice to women of the people in the countries where they worked, no small task in and of itself, thus the most unlikely of agents became assets. Even the SOE was referred to by Churchill as the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Hudson recalled a scenario in his SOE training where one of the directors of operations, Major Gerard Morrell, explained the firm's stance on female agents. In our experience, women are more brave, more loyal, and more resourceful than men. However, Hudson describes acts of sexual misconduct he committed against his partner, Muriel Bick, blatantly unaware that his behavior was harmful. When they initially parachuted into France, after landing, Hudson disentangled himself from his parachute, walked over to Bick, waited for her to disentangle herself, ignoring the third person who had parachuted with them, who was another man, who, and then without a word, dipped her into a kiss. Hudson didn't ask her permission for, before kissing her. He'd only just met her as well, a few hours before, and they hadn't even really conversed. He notices that she gave him a look afterwards, but he discounts it. He was a married man with a child, and it was also not the first time that he'd parachuted into France. His treatment of Bic was biased from the start, and he said it himself in his memoirs, explaining, once more we went through the procedure that George and I had already experienced 18 months before. We felt ourselves to be old hands now, and of course, there was this young, attractive woman to impress. After Bic's death, Hudson was partnered with Butt, who I mentioned before, Sonia D'Artois Butt, When he was partnered with uh, Sonia, he also handled her with kid gloves. He describes a, a morning a few days after they were partnered. Sonia was sleeping upstairs and I was installed on a sofa on the ground floor. We were awakened by the sound of bombs falling nearby. Thinking that Sonia might be frightened, I dashed upstairs to her room. I need not have bothered. She was completely unperturbed. Later on in their relationship and their partnership, but reveals to Hudson that she was sexually assaulted by two German officers. They didn't even know she was a spy. She was just a woman in the countryside that they chose to attack. She began by saying, something rather disagreeable happened to me last night. She tells him what happened, finishing nonchalantly, luckily they didn't discover the American passes. Hudson was speechless at her cavalier attitude, but it was an attitude that Butt felt required to take in order to keep her standing in his eyes. Her susceptibility to sexual assault as a woman would have made her a liability as a spy. To show her strength and to prove that she could handle being a spy just like any man could, she waited until the next day to even report her assault and then brushed over it lightly as, she, as, as lightly as she could. To do otherwise would be weakness on her part and she would have been seen as a hysterical and unreliable partner. Hudson confirms that the women were seen and treated differently and thus had to work harder to prove their capabilities. With this anecdote about being interviewed for a TV documentary in the 1990s, the producer was looking at photos of the female agents hanging on the walls at a special forces club in London, and he asked Hudson, I see that some of the women were rather handsome. Wasn't it difficult not to fall in love with them? To which Hudson responded, I can confirm the truth of both of these pronouncements. This was obviously meant to be a compliment to female spies, and especially the ones he worked with, but these small details that he slipped into his narrative are problematic. They show clear and blatant examples of women having to go above and beyond even the men's call of duty, and how one of the most common risks that they faced out in the field were their partner's own attitudes towards them as women. This was further supported by the fact that Hudson confessed to having fallen in love with Sonia, though she resisted having an affair and after her service returned home to her husband. Hudson, on the other hand, divorced his wife, unable to stop pining for Sonia.
going to be going into the biography of some specific female spies. And the first woman I'm going to talk about is Hannah Shenish. Um, and in Israel, she's very famous. There are actually more streets named after Hannah than there are after Golda Meir, the first female prime minister of Israel. So Hannah Shenish was born on July 17, 1921, to a Jewish family in Hungary. She was enrolled in a private Protestant school for girls that also happened to accept Catholic and Jewish pupils. Most of those of the Jewish faith had to pay three times the amount that the Catholics paid. However, Shenish only had to pay twice the regular tuition because she was considered a gifted student. This, along with the realization that the situation of the Jews in Hungary was becoming precarious, prompted Shenish to embrace Zionism. She graduated in 1939 and decided to immigrate to what was then the British Mandate of Palestine in order to study and the girls' agricultural school at Nahalal. In 1941, she joined Kibbutz Stot Yam, and then she joined the Haganah, which was the paramilitary group that ended up laying the foundation for the Israel Defense Forces. It was a clandestine military project whose ultimate purpose was to offer aid to the beleaguered European Jewry. In 1943, she enlisted in the British Women's Auxiliary Air Force as an aircraft woman second class. Later that same year, she was recruited into the Special Operations Executive. On March 14, 1944, she and colleagues Yoel Palvi and Peretz Goldstein were parachuted into Yugoslavia, and they joined a partisan group in order to aid the anti-Nazi forces until they were able to commence their true mission, which was to enter Hungary. But the German invasion of Hungary in March of 1944 postponed their plans. After landing, they learned that the Germans had already moved forward and begun their occupation of Hungary. So the men decided to call off the mission. It was too dangerous. Shanish decided to continue on, and she headed for the Hungarian border. Once there, she and her companions, some refugees, were arrested by the Hungarian forces, who found her British military transmitter. They, that, the, which is what she used to communicate with the SOE and other partisan groups. Um, she was taken to a prison, stripped, tied to a chair, and whipped and clubbed for three days. She lost several teeth as a result of the beating. The guards wanted to know the code for her transmitter so they could find out who the parachutists were and trap others. She got transferred to a Budapest prison where she was repeatedly tortured and interrogated but she only revealed her name, and she refused to provide the transmitter code. While in prison, she used a mirror to flash signals out the window to prisoners in other cells and communicated using large cutout letters that she placed in her cell window, one at a time, and by drawing them again David in the dust. When the Hungarian authorities realized that Shenesh would not be broken, they arrested her mother and the two women came face to face with each other for the first time in almost five years. Catherine Shenish had had no idea that her daughter had left Palestine, not to speak of the fact that she was now in Hungary. Initially shocked as they brought in the young woman with bruised eyes and who had lost a front tooth in the torture process, but she rapidly gained her, regained her composure and both mother and daughter refused to give the authorities the performance that would lead to the information they had sought. For three months, the women were so near, yet so far, sharing the same prison walls, but unable to do more than catch short glimpses of each other. In September of 1944, after Catherine was suddenly released, she spent most of her waking hours seeking legal assistance for her daughter, who, being a Hungarian national, was to be tried as a spy. In November of 1944, Hannah Shenish came up before a tribunal and eloquently pleaded her own cause, warning the judges that as the end of the war was nearing, their own fates would soon hang in the balance. She was still convicted as a spy, and she was sentenced to death. But the court decided not to carry out her sentence with any alacrity. However, her poignant speech that she gave during the trial was taken as a personal affront to the officer in charge of the prison she was being held at, Colonel Simon, who came into her cell on the morning of November 7th and presented her with two options to beg for a pardon, or to face death by a firing squad. Refusing to beg clemency from her captors, who she didn't even think were legally able to uh, try her case, Shenish penned short notes to her mother and her comrades, 
and she went to her death at the age of 23 in a snow-covered Budapest courtyard, refusing a blindfold so that she would have to look her murderers in the face. Her body was buried by unknown people in the Jewish graveyard of Budapest. Her body was eventually moved to a place of honor in Mount Herzl in Israel, where fallen soldiers, even now, are buried. I've personally been there to visit, and I, I can attest that her grave is in a place of honor. After the Cold War, a Hungarian military court um, officially exonerated her, and her kin in Israel were informed in, on November 5th, 1993. She kept diary entries until her last day, where she wrote her poetry. One poem began, a voice called, and I went. I went, for a voice called. Another read, blessed is the match that it consumed in kindling flame. Blessed is the flame that burns in the secret fastness of the heart. Blessed is the heart with the strength to stop its beating for honor's sake. Blessed is the match consumed in kindling flame. The following lines were found in Hannah's cell after her execution. One, two, three, eight feet long, two strides across, the rest is dark. Light hangs over me like a question mark. One, two, three, maybe another week, or next month may still find me here but death, I feel, is very near. I could have been 23 next July. I gambled on what mattered most. The dice were cast. I lost.
As the youngest of six children, Nancy Wake's upbringing in New Zealand and Australia was marked by adversity, especially after her father abandoned their family. Through, though considered a brilliant pupil at school, she was forever feeling out of place and unhappy with being bogged down by household chores like cooking and cleaning. She ran away from home at the age of 16 and became a nurse at an asylum. When she got a request from an aunt who passed away, she made her way to Europe, where she worked as a journalist and European correspondent, such as for Hearst News. Shortly after she moved to France, she met Henri Fioca, an extremely wealthy industrialist and they became, they became engaged. Like that, her life was transformed. She married Henri, and they began to live an indolent lifestyle. Despite the luxuries her everyday life now offered, she and her husband worried about the war. Wake desperately wanted to find a way to help her country. Her position of, of wealth now afforded her the ability to, to do so. Yet even her husband was at a loss to understand her motives and wish to contribute as a woman. It will be my turn soon, Henri said. Worry about that when it comes, and when it does, I want to go too. My dear nanny, what as? An ambulance driver. But you can't drive. <laughs> you must have me taught. But you have no ambulance, and France has no ambulances either. I know. You must give me one of the firm's trucks. Convert it for me, then I'll drive it to the front. But Nanny, why? Because I want to help. You can help here. Don't be stupid, Henri, but here we help no one. But, but why do you want to help? War isn't for women. How often have I told you how I won the last war for France? Now I will win it again. Have you no confidence in me? Certainly. That's why I want to go to the war myself. I'm sick of hearing how you won the last one. This one I shall win. <laughs> Despite not understanding Wake's desire to involve herself in the war, he provided her with an ambulance and driving lessons. Wake was as good as her word and worked tirelessly through the first half of 1940. At first, she delivered clothes to refugee centers, but when the blitz began, Wake did whatever she could to contribute. Nancy picked up refugees, wounded soldiers, machine gun civilians, anyone at all, always ignoring the police who forbade her to, to approach the front any closer and would load up her ambulance once again. The police believed that the work that Wake was devoted to was far too dangerous for a mere woman to perform. They didn't believe that she was capable of this kind of work and wouldn't succeed anyways. They didn't feel the need to stop a silly, interfering woman who wanted to put herself at risk for a mission she could surely never accomplish. If Wake had been a man attempting the same thing, she most likely would have been stopped or reasoned with or not allowed to interfere. When her ambulance finally broke down and France fell to Germany, Wake was devastated and felt at a loss. There wasn't anything else she could do. However, once home with Henri again, she met with a British officer who was uh, interned at the fortress in Marseille by the French military authorities. She began providing assistance at great personal risk to those interned there. Despite his fears for her, Henri provided Wake with any money she asked for to support the plans to help those British officers escape um, and the prisoners of war to escape as well. Wake was asked to carry messages for some of the escaped spies. When warned that it might be risky, she replied, what isn't? When she successfully carried these messages, she was then asked to deliver packages as well. And then she became a courier for a second French resistance group. She was forced into leading a dual life. No one could know what she was doing as she traversed France, delivering letters and packages, and so she had to maintain her opulent lifestyle as well, partying late into the night with her friends in public settings in order to mask her other activities. The intelligence activities became so much a part of her life that Wake was forced to rent another apartment away from her home so as not to bring suspicion on her husband, his family, or their business. As a cover for renting another property, she had to pretend that it was intended to be used by her and a lover and thus kept a secret. Her husband was greatly amused. <laughs> by November of 1942, the Nazis marched into unoccupied France and the Gestapo first began talking about the White Mouse a moniker that they had given to Wake in lieu of her identity. She continually eluded capture, only adding to the Gestapo's frustration and impatience to discover her identity. By 1943, 
She had become the Gestapo's most wanted, with a five million franc price on her head. The year her circuit was betrayed, she had to escape incarceration and she was forced to flee to England on foot via the Pyrenees Mountain. Her husband, Henri, stayed behind. He was later captured, tortured, and executed by the Gestapo because he would not betray her. Until the war ended, she was unaware of her husband's death and she subsequently blamed herself for it. Once in Britain, though, she again volunteered herself for service and she ended up being recruited by none other than the SOE. Once she began her training, Vera Atkins, who was one of the leaders, recalled that Wake put the men to shame by her cheerful spirit and strength of character. Wake described her own tactics like this. A little powder and a little drink on the way, and I'd pass a German post and wink and say, do you want to search me? God, what a flirtatious little bastard I was. In 1944, Wake was parachuted into France, and she was supposed to become a liaison between London and the local Maquis group that was headed by Captain Henri Tardivat in the forest of Tronquet. Upon discovering her tangled in a tree in her parachute, Captain Tardivat greeted her, remarking, I hope that all the trees in France bear such beautiful fruit this year. To which she replied, don't give me that French shit. <laughs> Once back in France, her duties included distributing weapons and equipment as well as managing the organization's finances. Wake also helped to lead attacks on German hotspots, such as the local Gestapo headquarters in Mont Luzon. In that mission alone, 38 Germans were killed. She herself killed a sentry with her bare hands to stop him from raising the alarm during a raid. Speaking about this abrupt execu execution, Wake recalled, they taught this judo chop stuff with the flat of the hand at the SOE, and I practiced away at it, but this was the only time I used it. Whack! And it killed him all right. I was really surprised. <laughs> After the death of a section leader, Wake took over the McKee French resistance group, and she ended up leading more than 7,500 men. At one point, Wake discovered that her men were protecting a girl who was a German spy. They didn't have the heart to kill her in cold blood, but when Wake insisted that she would perform the execution herself, they capitulated. On another occasion, to replace the codes her wireless operator had been forced to destroy in a German raid, Wake rode a bicycle for more than 190 miles through several German checkpoints to get to another group's wireless operator and send a message to London to apprise them of the situation. Unfortunately, when she got there after that 190 mile bike ride, she couldn't convince the operator that she was with the SOE. So she finally searched out a different local McHugh group who finally sent her message. Wade then had to ride the bike back to where she started, and she did all of this in 72 hours. At war's end, she had earned more decorations than any other British servicewoman before her.
Noor Inayat Khan was born on January 1st of 1914 in Moscow. Her father, Inayat Khan, came from a noble Indian Muslim family, which technically made Noor a princess. He lived in Europe as a musician and a teacher of Sufism, which was a specific branch of Islam. Her mother, Pirani Amina Begum, who was originally Aura Ray Baker, was an American from Albuquerque, New Mexico, who met Inayat Khan during his travels in the United States. In 1914, shortly before the outbreak of World War I, the family left Russia for London, and they lived in Bloomsbury, actually. I happened to have lived there myself in 2015. In 1920, they moved to France, settling near Paris. But after the death of her father in, 19, um, in 1927, Noor took on the responsibility for her grief-stricken mother and her younger siblings. As a young girl, she was described as quiet, shy, sensitive, and dreamy. She studied child psychology at the Sorbonne and music at the Paris Conservatory, where she composed for the harp and the piano. She began a career writing poetry and children's stories, and she became a regular contributor to children's magazines and French radio. In 1939, her book, The 20 Jataka Tales, inspired by the Jataka Tales of Buddhist tradition, was published in London. After the outbreak of the Second World War, when France was overrun by German troops, the family fled to Bordeaux, and from there by sea to England. Although Noor was deeply influenced by the pacifist teachings of her father, she decided to help defeat Nazi tyranny. In November of 1940, she joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. Later, Noor was recruited to join the SOE as a wireless operator in occupied territory. She would be the first woman sent over in that capacity, and all the other women agents before her had been sent over as couriers. Having had previous wire uh, telegraphy training, she had an edge on those who were just beginning their radio training, and she was both fast and accurate. The ultimate exercise she had to endure in, able, in order to be able to go out into the field was a mock Gestapo interrogation, and it was intended to give agents a taste of what might be in store for them if they were captured, as well as give them some practice in maintaining the recover story. Her escaping officer found her interrogation almost unbearable and reported that she seemed terrified, so overwhelmed that she nearly lost her voice, and then afterwards she was trembling and quite blanched. Her finishing report, which the official historian of the F, which stands for France, section of the SOE found in her personal file long after the war read, not overburdened with brains, but has worked hard and shown keenness, apart from some dislike of the security side of the course. She is an unstable and temperamental personality, and it's very doubtful whether she's really suited to work in the field. Next to this comment, Maurice Buckmaster, who was the head of the F section, had written in the margin, nonsense, and we don't want them overburdened with brains. Her superiors held mixed opinions on her suitability for secret warfare, and her training ended up being incomplete due to the need to get those wireless telegraphy operators into the field. Her childlike qualities, particularly her gentle manner and her lack of ruse, had greatly worried her instructors at the training schools. One instructor even wrote that she confesses that she would not like to have to do anything two-faced. Her mission would be an especially dangerous one. So successful had female couriers been that the decision was then made to use them as wireless operators as well, which was even more dangerous work, probably the most dangerous work of all. The job of the operator was to maintain a link between the circuit in the field and London, and they would send and receive messages about planned sabotage operations or about where arms were needed for resistance fighters. Without that communication, it was almost impossible for any resistance strategy to be coordinated. But the operators were highly vulnerable to detection, which was improving as the war progressed. In 1943, an operator's life, expect life expectancy in the field was six weeks. After her network was betrayed, she was the only one to escape. She managed for months to avoid capture, living on the run and with no one to turn to. In an attempt to disguise herself, she dyed her hair red. In the end, however, she was captured. On October 13, 1943, she was arrested and interrogated. During her detainment, she tried to escape twice. Guards testified after the war that she did not give the Gestapo a single piece of information, but lied consistently. 
A month after being captured, Khan, along with fellow SOE agents John Renshaw Starr and Leon Fay, escaped. But they were recaptured as there was an air raid alert as they escaped across the roof. Regulations for an air raid required a prisoner count at those kinds of times, and so their escape was discovered before they could get away. After refusing to sign a declaration renouncing any future escape attempts, she was taken to Germany for safe custody, and she was imprisoned in solitary confinement in complete secrecy. For 10 months, she was kept there, shackled at the hands and the feet. She became classified as highly dangerous, and she remained uncooperative and continued to refuse to give any information on her work or her fellow operatives. Although in her despair at the appalling nature of her confinement, other prisoners could hear her crying at night. Nor was abruptly transferred to Dachau concentration camp with fellow agents Yolanda Beekman, Madeleine Dahmerman, and Eliani Plumen. There are two theories for Nor's execution. The first is that the following morning after they arrived to Dachau, September 13th, the four women were made to kneel together and were executed, a single shot to the head. But testimony of other Dachau prisoners suggests that while the other three were executed together, Nor was kept alive an extra night in which the guards viciously raped and beat her, most likely because of her Indian heritage. She too was shot in the head from behind, but before her murder, her last word was liberty.
There were four women SOE agents who were brought to Natzweiler camp to be sec secretly executed, and four women SOE agents taken to Dachau to be secretly executed. The alleged executions of these women was top secret, so secret that there was no written execution order and no records kept of their death, and even to this day, nothing has been found. The logical place to send the women would have been the Ravensbrück camp, which was the only all-female concentration camp in Germany, or used by the Nazi party near Berlin. And it's where they could have been executed and their bodies disposed of in the crematorium. The women that were allegedly killed at Natzweiler were Andre Burrell, Vera Lee, Diane Rowden, and Sonia Olszanewski. Noor Inayat Khan, Elinani Pluman, Yolanda Beekman, and Madeline Garmament. that were executed at Ravensbrook, and those included Denise Block, Lillian Rolf, Violetta Shabo, separately executed at Ravensbrook, Cicely Lafort.
So now I want to pose to you another question. What was so different about these 12 women who were executed? What heinous crime had the women committed that was worse than anything that the male SOE agents had ever done? And why were eight women taken to Natzweiler and Dachau, both camps for only men, to be secretly executed instead of being taken to Ravensbrück, the camp for women? Why were four women SOE agents at Ravensbrück executed in the middle of a typhus epidemic six months after they were brought to the camp? The organizers of the SOE were all men, while the couriers were almost all women. In other words, the women were low-ranking members of the SOE, while the men had far more important positions. This makes it even harder to understand why the women, who were just following the orders of the men, were ex executed, while the majority of the men were spared. Why had the Germans left no official documentation of these executions, although it was not a violation of the Geneva Convention to execute spies who were not in military uniform when captured? You see, the German military command had decreed that men helping or hiding Allied servicemen on the run would be executed. Women would be deported to the camps. And the reward for denouncing them was 10,000 francs. If the decree of the German military command had been followed, male spies captured should have been shot or hanged, and the women should have been sent to the women's concentration camp at Ravensbrück. Instead, while all spies became nach du Nebel prisoners, while under another decree that was issued by Hitler himself, the men were imprisoned, while the women who worked below them were executed. So the Nacht und, ne the Nacht und Nebel prisoners were made to disappear into the night and fog, so that their families would think that they were dead. They weren't allowed to send or receive letters, and their families weren't notified if they died while in captivity. The purpose of this was to discourage resistance. Natzweiler was one of the main camps where the NNN prisoners were sent by the Gestapo. Female NNN prisoners were mostly sent to Ravensbrück. Until Sonia Olszewski, who was one of the women I showed you, was finally identified as the fourth Natzweiler victim, it was actually assumed that Noor and Iyak Khan had been executed at Natzweiler, because if you notice, they looked remarkably uh, similar. When Vera Adkins found the record of Sonia Olszewski's imprisonment at Karlsruhe, which was a French prison, before she got sent to Natzweiler, she assumed that this was an alias for Noor and Iyak Khan, who fit the description of one of the women that a male agent imprisoned at the camp, and who was spared, had given her. Sonia Olszewski had been recruited by a different agent connected to the network in the spring of 1942, out in the fields. She was French. And so there was actually no record of her in the SOE files until that point. Madeleine Darmament was a courier. She was captured on the day she landed. As she landed, she was seized. She had done nothing and knew nothing. So why was she executed? Eliane Plumen was a courier as well, and she wasn't even involved in any of the very famous radio games that we see all these movies about. Yolanda Beekman was pregnant when she left for France to go to work as a wireless operator. And that is according to her mother's official statement entered into the official records of the SOE. Pregnant prisoners were usually sent to Ravensbrook. So the question remains, why were these women treated so harshly? Why were they treated like men? My theory is that these women were treated even more harshly than men, and that it was because the Germans considered them to be like men. These women were far outside the comfortable societal roles in Britain. So you can only imagine how far out of their comfort zone German men would have been while dealing with these strong women. German women at the time were supposed to be at home, taking care of the family, to fall in line with their husband's wishes. These women were anything but compliant. In their men, these women, doing men's work and doing it successfully at that, could only be because they themselves were more masculine than feminine in nature. However, these strong women ended up being treated even more harshly than women because the German officials were scared of these strong women. They resented them, feared them even. They came to hate female spies more than the men, which caused them to beat and isolate and rape these women, to treat them far more harshly. For their defiance of the social order, a concept incredibly important to the Nazis, these women were punished. While the men lived, these women died, 
sent to all male concentration camps and their records destroyed so that they could disappear from history's records and no one might know how the Nazi social order had been threatened by a few brave, brave women. Because of the lack of records, we may never actually have concrete evidence that these women were executed. And believe me, I've tried. I've dug through archives and tried my best to find something. But most historians do recognize that these women, women were. Even Dachau itself has a small memorial in place to commemorate these women. Vera Adkins, who was the assistant head of the F section of the SOE, pushed to have a memorial created at Dachau by the British to honor these women for their service. At the last minute, the funding was pulled and the monument was never built. This was likely due to the fact that the British didn't want to recognize or highlight these women's contributions. Women had never been intended to be used in combat. It defied convention, societal standards, and even international law to do so. And despite giving the ultimate sacrifice, these women's service were left in the night and fog to be forgotten. But this war was won by ungentlemanly warfare. And after all, who could be more suited to ungentlemanly warfare than a woman? If the memorial had been built, this is the inscription that Atkins had chosen to be etched upon it, a short poem by Walt Whitman. After the dazzle of the day is gone, only the dark, dark night shows to my eyes the stars. After the clangor of organ majestic, or chorus, or perfect band, silent athwart my soul moves the symphony true. Thank you.